To most people, August 20th, 2023 is a pretty average date. If you're watching this video the day it came out, August 20th, 2023 is today, and for many of us, today probably won't be anything particularly out of the ordinary. However, to those who engage with the world and lore of cyberpunk, August 20th, 2023 is a date with immense diegetic significance. There's a fair few fans, including myself, who have awaited today with a passive interest for a long time. In a sense, it's simply cool to see what we once thought of as the far-flung future become the present. I'm reminded, for example, of October 21st, 2015, the date to which Marty McFly traveled in the acclaimed Back to the Future Part 2. It's no stretch of the imagination to say that August 20th, 2023 is cyberpunk's version of this same phenomenon, and may just be the most important, pivotal date in the game's entire history, a barrier in time between two of the franchise's key eras, 2020, the year in which the cyberpunk tabletop game's second version takes place, and the time of the Red in 2045, as explored in the third iteration, Cyberpunk Red. It's a time in which several of cyberpunk's most notable personalities would band together, a time that shaped the fate of two of the most powerful megacorps for over 20 years, not to mention the one and only event in all of cyberpunk history which can lay the foundation for an entirely separate canon. That's why today, in this special August 20th, 2023 upload, we'll be exploring today's events as played out in the world of cyberpunk, the day that a nuclear device was detonated in Arasaka Tower. An impactful moment in time both literally and figuratively, this is the full lore, history, and mystery of the AHQ disaster, also known as the Night City Holocaust. All right, let's get to the bottom of this. There's a lot of misinformation to sort through pertaining to the AHQ disaster, which, by the way, is decidedly the most YouTube-safe name for today's topic, so it's the one I'm going to be using most. From the Firestorm books, where the event was first explored, to the Cyberpunk Red Core book, to Cyberpunk 2077, no one source tells this story on its own, or tells it entirely correctly. Throughout this video, I'm going to be talking a lot about canon and the different canons of cyberpunk, because, in a sense, the AHQ disaster is at the very heart of cyberpunk canon to begin with. It's the only major event where information's canonicity or legitimacy is really even called into question. So, to set the foundation, I want to first establish what isn't canon, as all of this will help us refine our search and narrow down the places where legitimate information can be found. Cyberpunk V3, also known as Cyberpunk 2030X, I think that's how it's pronounced, was originally the third tabletop installment of the cyberpunk game. It's set in an era after the Fourth Corporate War, where the dark future has somehow become even more dark. Concepts like government and the net are a thing of the past taking a massive shift away from the roots of the series, and into a world characterized by the collapse of multitudinous megacorps and an inability to catalog even the recent past. The world of 2030X is gritty and dystopian in the most literal way, and Mike Pondsmith, the creator of Cyberpunk, seemingly regrets having made it. Fans were not as receptive to 2030X as they were to previous expansions, owing to a variety of reasons, not the least of which was a jarring new art style that used action figures, dolls, and potentially 3D modeling, in place of the beloved hand-drawn art style that had been in the previous source books. I mean, you can't tell me this isn't disturbingly uncanny. Look at this. The expansion has since been deemed as non-canon by Pondsmith. As a result, this also calls into question the Firestorm series, which was originally published as a way to introduce fans to the Fourth Corporate War, and at the time was intended as a lead-in to the game's third edition. Viewers of the channel will know, however, that I reference the Firestorm books quite a lot, and that's because, fortunately, Pondsmith has identified the exact moment where the ongoing mainline story diverges from that of 2030X. In a reply on Reddit, Pondsmith makes the important distinction that there were in fact two nuclear weapons present at the time of the disaster. The first was the one utilized by the attackers, as we'll see later. 
but the second was a bit different. The second one was an aerial denial nuke that went off to create the world of 2030X, but since that is no longer canon, it never went off. Instead, there's a roughly 4 kiloton nuke roaming around loose in the cyberpunk red universe. Somebody has it, but I'm not telling who. While we'll discuss this bomb and who had it later on in the video, the important part for now is that, in Pondsmith's own words, the detonation of the second weapon would have created the world of 2030X, so I think it's safe to assume that anything that happens up until that point, and doesn't conflict with later sources, or that hasn't been outright retconned, is fair game. This means that literally every Everything in the entire Firestorm series, except for the very last page of the last book, is still canon by default, if my understanding is correct. Unless, once again, one of the aforementioned specifiers comes into play. If you're wondering what's on that very last page, it's actually the story in which Spider Murphy soul kills Kei Arasaka, which is actually still insinuated to happen as well, since Kei does die, so I think the validity of these books is still very much apparent. The other key thing to know before we get into the lore is that Cyberpunk 2077's version of events is also not an accurate telling, though it is still canon, sort of. Jay Gray, media ambassador for Artel Saurian Games, the company behind Cyberpunk, explained the discrepancies between Johnny's memories of the event and the pre-existing explanation offered in earlier source material. When writing into episode 46 of a fan-created show called the Cyberpunk Lorecast, Gray offered three key reasons for the distinction. One, the chips damaged, obviously referring to the relic biochip which housed Johnny's engram. Two, this isn't Johnny, but a copy of Johnny. And three, Johnny is an unreliable narrator. Johnny needs to be the biggest actor on the stage. Notice how his gun is one-shotting every guard, and blowing off limbs with a single bullet. Notice how a seven-foot-tall cyborg gets gunned down, but somehow Johnny gets taken down without a scratch. Notice how Johnny is playing with samurai, despite the fact that this takes place almost a decade after samurai broke up. Of course Johnny takes center stage, of course he's responsible for the bomb, because if there's a nuke, how could he not be the one who said it? He's the hero. Of course he's got a confrontation with the big bad, Saburo. At first, I was skeptical of this interaction and its validity, but upon looking at it more closely, it seems Artelsorian Games has a pretty good relationship with this podcast, and their official Twitter has shouted out and even interacted with them before, so I'm actually inclined to give this explanation some credit, though even if you don't buy into this claim, the fact remains that it's just about impossible for both the source books and Cyberpunk 2077 to be simultaneously accurate just about any other way. And once more, we definitely know that these stories coexist and are meant to play off each other, because Pondsmith himself has made sure to outline it. Now that we've got all of that out of the way though, let's actually begin diving into the story, starting in the year 2021. IHAG, a German corporation focused on oceanographic shipping and nautical equipment, had just filed for bankruptcy. Though none would know it at the time, this simple event would be the impetus behind an infamously turbulent conflict known as the Fourth Corporate War. Though IHAG itself had collapsed, the company's assets proved valuable to two other rival megacorporations. The first contender, hailing from France, was called Sino, a shipbuilding and subaquatic tech company, and the second, an American firm specializing in much the same, was Otec. Given their respective areas of expertise, it's easy to see why both corporations would benefit from the defunct assets of a company like IHAG. And indeed, when the time came to start the bidding, both companies were dead set on acquiring that value for themselves. However, dealings would initially close at a standstill. Being nearly identical in size, power, and pull within the market, both Sino and Otec lacked the funds or power necessary to sufficiently trump the other in the market, and therefore, with equally vested interest, neither party was able to make a runaway buy. This is where the first tensions would begin to flare. Seeking more substantial action, Otec, in an act of aggression, subcontracted the American security company Militech International Armaments to aid in operations and, in all likelihood, to take steps to undermine Sino in secret. Unfortunately for them, however, Otec's rival would understand the intent and responded by hiring a company for much the same purpose, partnering with the infamous Arasaka, a Japanese-based security and manufacturing brand, perhaps the world's only true competitor to Militech both then and now. 
Known for their respective efficiency and extensive private arsenals, it was only a matter of time before bloodshed would ensue. After a year of back and forth, the conflict had become personal for Arasaka and Militech, while Sino and Otek had largely withdrawn from direct battle due to pressures from world governments, which were beginning to result in asset seizure. It wasn't long before the Aqua Corps began pleading with their hired help, demanding that the fighting come to a close, but being dramatically outranked and outfunded, there was very little that could actually be done by virtually anyone. As a result, the vast majority of the Fourth Corporate War would be fought by Militech and Arasaka themselves, all while governments scrambled to shut them down. It is this era, at the very height of private warmongering, that would herald in the conditions necessary for the next catastrophe in the chain. 2022 saw the devastating effects of Rach Bartmoss's data crash. Having planned the attack since the Ihara Grub net transformation of 2014, the data crash was an unprecedented attack on the infrastructure of the net itself, resulting in its near-complete destruction. This rendered most of the information there unusable, and caused several different factions and corporations to scramble, resulting in the most extensive data loss scenario ever. Although Bartmoss's attack is inherently linked to many events during the Fourth Corporate War, and indeed the entire cyberpunk timeline, it's particularly important to our focus here today, as without it, Arasaka may never have created its Reliquary Database. Also known as the Secure Database, the Reliquary Database was a project overseen by Saburo Arasaka, father of CEO K. Arasaka, and puppet master behind the entire organization. It was created beneath Night City's Arasaka Tower Complex in anticipation of an event where net infrastructure became unusable or otherwise ineffective, a possibility which Arasaka had been made aware of before anyone else. To this end, the database preserved all manner of raw information from worldwide networks, basically a way for Arasaka to leverage tons of knowledge that would otherwise become inaccessible in the crash. This would essentially render huge swaths of code and data as effectively proprietary information, offering a huge advantage for the company, but also, seeing as Arasaka was significantly less encumbered by the data crash as a result, the Reliquary database project also put them ahead of all of their competitors by default. I think it's safe to say that even in the best of times, an act like this would have garnered the attention of Militech, but there's no doubt that the present tension between the megacorps would have driven mere weariness to dangerous new heights. It's well known that Militech's CEO at the time, Donald Lundy, was something of a paranoid man, especially when it came to Arasaka. And so it was that the higher-ups at the company began devising a plan, one which, though incredibly risky, held the best chance for eliminating their competitors' advantage once and for all. Arasaka may have escaped having to recover from the data crash, but the total destruction of their headquarters would be a lot harder to reckon with. Now, all of the pieces were in place for the AHQ disaster to occur, and to get the ball rolling, Militech would need a team. Morgan Blackhand was a legendary solo, very active in and around the time of the Fourth Corporate War, who Militech had hired a number of times to engage in mutually beneficial work. Knowing that an attack on the Arasaka database was going to require the utmost precision, care, and attention to detail, there's no doubt that Blackhand, fondly known as the Solo's Solo, was one of their first contacts. However, it was clear that though Blackhand certainly possessed the skills befitting of a team leader, and Militech undoubtedly had enough special operations troopers to supply the firepower, invading the Arasaka headquarters was going to require those with an even more diverse set of skills, and perhaps even some former experience. As the incursion team began to take form, several other notable personalities would be recruited for the cause, three of which had stormed the building ten years prior in 2013. Johnny Silverhand was one, a notorious rocker boy and rebel whose lifelong hatred for corporations and enthusiastic nature made him an obvious pick for the team. Johnny had previously collaborated with the solo Rogue Amendieres and the WNS-affiliated media Lyle Thompson to stage a rescue operation for the famed netrunner Alt Cunningham, who was held in Arasaka's Night City Tower and made to recreate her infamous Soul Killer software. While this operation did not result in the successful recollection of Alt, 
result in her physical form, her consciousness was found to be residing within Arasaka systems. But what made them exceptionally valuable to Black Hand and to Militech was the information these three could provide about the interior layout of the AHQ. Now, that knowledge could be leveraged again, and also allowed for further retribution against the Corp that had taken their comrade's life. Aside from these three, there was also Spider Murphy, a talented netrunner in her own right, and one of the best, save only Rach Bartmoss and Alt Cunningham both of whom were Murphy's personal friends before their respective untimely deaths, both at the hands of Arasaka. There was also Shaitan, a full Borg convert with a lifetime vendetta against the Corp, making the man a steadfast, impregnable juggernaut both physically and mentally. An Aldecaldo nomad named Santiago, who had also joined Johnny and company in the 2013 raid, was contacted to partake in this new mission too, but he was unable to join, though he did arrange for members of the Lobos, which was a subgroup under the Aldecaldo umbrella, to help in his stead. Finally, there were also said to be a few other miscellaneous, unnamed solos and operatives. These extra participants were in fact the player characters of the adventure titled The Guns Silenced, founded Firestorm Shockwave. There's some debate to be had over whether this group is still canon in the mainline cyberpunk universe, for the fact that they aren't really mentioned after this one appearance. But to my knowledge, they've never been officially retconned. Most accounts from later materials just don't talk about them. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and take this to mean that they're still in. With the members of the mission assembled, the overall goals of the operation began to change, incorporating other aspects aside from simply destroying the database. Since the engram of Alt Cunningham also resided within Arasaka's network, it was decided that she ought to be rescued if possible. Though this complicated the plan somewhat, it was a no-brainer for most of the crew, considering their history with her, and the fact that Arasaka headquarters was not expected to be left standing at the end of the day, which could jeopardize her ability to be recovered in the future. There was also the matter of the program Alt had created while in Arasaka custody, Soul Killer, which at this point was in its third iteration and which in Militech's eyes ought to be destroyed as well. With these motives in mind, the plan was arranged around a configuration of three teams. The first was Strike Team Alpha, consisting of Johnny, Rogue, Spider, Lyle, Shaitan, a few Militech Spec Ops troopers, and the majority of the Aldecaldo's Lobos members. This group was tasked with destroying Soul Killer and rescuing Alt Cunningham's digitized consciousness, though they did have a secondary purpose as well. Morgan Blackhand had specifically set up Team Alpha as a sort of diversion, meant to draw the attention of Arasaka forces upwards, enabling easier traversal of the lower floors for the other teams. The fact of the matter was that Militech was much more more concerned with the successful destruction of their enemy's infrastructure than the rescue of Alt or the retrieval slash destruction of Soul Killer. And if that meant putting Johnny and the others up as pawns, well, what they didn't know couldn't hurt them, I guess, was the idea. The diversion would allow the next group, Strike Team Beta, composed of those various solos mentioned earlier, to have the time needed to enact their aspect of the plan, planting the bomb and destroying the reliquary database. As this system was stored in a basement sublevel, this team could enter the tower in a variety of ways. From here, they'd venture downwards, into the bowels of the Arasaka facility, carrying the bomb with them all the while. The final group, Strike Team Omega, was composed of Morgan Blackhand and a group of Militech Spec Ops troopers. They're said to have largely handled matters of cover fire, support, and extraction if and when it was needed. Though, there is a line in the Cyberpunk Red core book which has been taken to mean that Morgan himself may also have handled the nuke. This is never outright confirmed though, so it's entirely possible that this team really was just handling suppression and rescue. As the date of August 20th rolled around, all members of the incursion team gathered during daylight hours to discuss plans and prepare for the attack after sunset. They even met with General Patrick Eddington, a representative from the U.S. Armed Forces. Indeed, the government did exhibit interest of some kind in overseeing Militech's efforts here. It's well known that then-President Elizabeth Kress was once the CEO of Militech. As detailed in one of Cyberpunk 2077's TV programs, Your Business is My Business. The line between Militech and the Feds has always been fluid. CEO Donald Lundy previously headed the Pentagon. Elizabeth Kress, former president of the company for the greater part of a decade, later became president of the NUSA. 
Undoubtedly, this would have provided a conflict of interest during the Fourth Corporate War. If the government could get Militech to somehow make Arasaka look like they had instigated the attack, then that would provide the justification for Kress to take swift, harsh action against the Megacorp, removing them from the country, and in the process, kind of creating a monopoly for Militech. It also helped that if something happened in Night City, well, it wouldn't technically be on American soil. Night City was a sovereign power, meaning Kress would be able to give grounds for having Arasaka banned without anything having to actually happen in a region she was responsible for overseeing. At the time of the Red, these implications have been picked up on by in-universe conspiracy theorists, but in the omniscient perspective of the reader, they're confirmed to be 100% accurate. With government and Militech backing, the raiding party was supplied with whatever equipment they could need and at nightfall, when the remaining Lobos members arrived, everyone suited up together. A brief interaction from this prelude is offered in both Firestorm Shockwave and the Cyberpunk Red core book, and is one of several segments from Shockwave that has been reused in Red's Fall of the Tower story. It reads, The door of the trailer swings open, and a young man in dark leathers, still dusty from the road, hauls himself into the air-conditioned command truck. Humor glints from his eyes as light glints from the conchas on his hat and gun belt. A corned beef on rye is still half-eaten, clenched in his gunmetal gray fist. Evening, gato, si senoritas. The Aldecaldo, Santiago, he sends his regrets, but he has much to do now that the war is over. Many contracts for construction, many wounded and dead to look after, including family. But he has sent we Lobos to help in any way we can. Well, well. Almost like old times, eh, Johnny? Thompson runs the diagnostics on his FN Rawl one last time as he speaks. Camouflage green combat armor sits next to him, his camera already chipped into the helmet's control port. Not quite. We've got a lot better support than a thousand screaming fanboys this time. Rogue's grin quirks as she looks out at Shayton's huge camouflaged form leaning against the massive, self-propelled artillery unit parked next to their trailer. We may be rescuing alls, but the stakes are also a lot higher this time. A lot higher? Johnny's eyes are calm, but the hand clenches and unclenches like it's possessed. She's been running loose through Arasaka's mainframes for a decade, grunts Thompson. Stands to reason her luck was going to run out sooner or later. Last thing we need is that thing she created loose in the net after Raisha's fallout. Johnny stands, looks out into the night. Finally, he says, tonight. Tonight, Arasaka Tower falls for the last time. The assault would officially begin with Militech and government forces. Several AVs and ground units pinned down Arasaka throughout the city. From here, Strike Team Alpha would set things into motion. Silverhand and company would fly an AV to the very top of Night City's Arasaka HQ, landing on the roof and fighting their way inside the building. Consisting of some 130 floors, at this time, Arasaka Tower may have looked a little different. It's somewhat likely that the building may have had a less monolithic structure when compared to its current build. Instead, the tower may have actually been more accurately described as two independent structures, integrated with one another. Another. This was apparently a very common practice for corporate offices at the time. In fact, Arasaka's main HQ in Japan sported this same layout but it's still not 100% clear if the design was also present in Night City, though the maps and blueprints provided in Firestorm Shockwave do seem to suggest it. Regardless, in this first part of the mission, things proceeded relatively well. Shayton led the charge, with Johnny, Rogue, and Spider in tow. Together, these merry few descended ten floors to the Soul Killer Lab, but unfortunately, it hadn't taken long for K. Arasaka and his personal team to deduce the raiders' intentions. Sir. Yes, Taisa, what is it? We think they might be headed for the Soul Killer Project, but we aren't sure. There also seems to be a group of their forces headed for the command center. They could be aiming for the database. Interesting. Send Adam and two squads to deal with the forces at the Soul Killer Lab, and detach an additional platoon of troops to the command center. K. Arasaka hesitates for a moment, then turns to the young captain waiting there. Taisa, in addition, ready the laser uplink for a backup to Honshu, and turn on the nearest commsat for reception. And Taisa, yes sir, ready my AV, and have the Sea Viper standing by, just in case. Elsewhere, guys, this is Morgan. 
We have a problem. Listen up and don't talk. I don't want anyone to lock onto your positions if you reply. We think they've found you out. There are forces redeploying back to the tower, and comm chatter's different. Worse, they've just opened up that hardened bunker on the roof. It looks like a laser uplink system. Apparently, they wanted to make sure that they had a way of running a backup, even if we knocked out their LDLs and microwave gear. I'm leading a strike force in to knock it out, but that's going to force our hand. Looks like things are going to get rough. Sorry, Johnny swears under his breath. Things just keep getting better and better, don't they? Then he raises his voice. You heard the man. Let's get this damned door opened. We aren't going to have a lot of time. Along with the Lobos and the Spec Ops, the crew waited for Spider to electronically jimmy the lock to the Soul Killer lab, with the next leg of the story being another that's shared between Shockwave and the Red Core book. And we've got it. All right, the door's bypassed. Johnny stands up, the gun ready. Okay, Shayton, you drew short straw, so you're first in. The Borg nods and lifts his gun pod. Right. See when Valhalla if they've been lying to us. Shayton cracks open the door, scanning it with a remote extension, then flings the door open, whipping his gun pod up in a smooth motion and firing off two quick shots from the grenade launcher. Sorry about that. Auto gun in the far corner. Camera in the other. Taken care of. Well, if that's all, let's get to work. Spider, the computers are in the next room. Everyone else, secure the perimeter, and let's get those demolitions charges set up. Johnny strides into the room, as if it were a stage and not a secret lab. Once inside the lab, Spider Murphy extracted Alt's consciousness and dumped her engram into a memory suitcase. She also downloaded a few other things while she was at it, though. On one chip, she held Soul Killer's development info, and on the other, a copy of Soul Killer itself. Just then, though, Team Alpha would be interrupted in a most dire way. Going somewhere? Adam Smasher's voice cuts through the silent offices like a bullet crack. Someone screams, cover, as machine gun and shotgun fire from Arasaka troopers spray through the narrow hallway, cutting three of the team's spec ops troops in half. Spider scrambles behind a heavy pillar, as Rogue and Johnny take up position behind office furniture, wholly inadequate for the job of stopping heavy fire. Spider watches Shayton simply fade into near invisibility against a wall. Rogue pops off a burst from her rifle, then fires two grenades. The Aras seem to want the lab intact, and aren't using heavy weapons. Team Alpha is under no such constraint. Shayton fires off blast after blast from the portable cannon he calls a shotgun, but is tagged by an autogun burst that sends him rolling. People on both sides spasm and fall as high-velocity death fills the entire floor of the building. Somewhere, Spider hears Thompson scream in pain. Things are bad. There are too damn many of them, plus that damned Borg. Time to make a decision. Bullets chip at her cover while she hurriedly links her cyberdeck into the heavy suitcase memory stash carrying Alt. No time to double check, no time to confirm links or space available, she launches herself into the net, dragging the linked icons that represent Alt's personality, memories, and whatever else it is that makes her different from an expert system. All Alt has, she thinks, is a hope and a prayer. Here goes nothing. With a virtual toss, Spider fires the various portions of Alt out into the net, tagging them with a marker so that she can maybe retrieve them someday, and if she gets lucky enough, re-res them back into her second best, now first best friend. Friend. Then, things go from bad to worse. As Johnny, wrestling with the guilt of losing Alt once and facing that reality a second time, is influenced by his prosthetic arm. You see, Pondsmith has expressly said that the hand is a personification used to display Johnny's descent into cyberpsychosis. And here, it would be the influence of the hand that would lead to Johnny's inevitable death. Better to burn out, says the hand. Yeah. Johnny says to himself, and he knows what he has to do. Suddenly, Johnny's voice rings out, not in song, but in challenge. Hey, Steelhead, let's rock and roll. Johnny is standing in plain sight, a Militech SMG in one hand, the Malorian in the other. He begins pumping out rounds at Adam. Adam turns, but hesitates, astonished at the audacity of the rocker boy, challenging him with weapons that wouldn't even crease his cyborg armor. An arm comes up, the auto shotgun in it opens fire, APDS rounds cut the young rocker, in half. Johnny spins and falls to the ground, a surprised look on his face, the Malorian still smoking in his fist. It only takes a second. But a second is all Shayton needs. He seems to emerge from the wall behind Adam and grapples with him. Seeing an opening, Rogue and Spider react as one. Rogue stands, bullets streaming from her pistols like tears, raking down Arasaka troopers. Spider sits up and fires, picking Ara targets and putting them down, one shot after another. It's all just a V-SIM, she says to herself. Just a game. 
just a game. Adam lurches around, but Shayton's grip is that of desperation. Spider sees that Shayton's right arm hangs shattered and limp at his side, blasted by a grenade. It's only a matter of seconds before Adam gets free and takes them all down. Get out of here. I've got him. Shayton's hollow, metallic voice bellows at the two women. The rest of the Aras are down, but so are the Spec Ops. Rogue, Spider, and a crippled Thompson are alone with the two battling Borgs. They can hear more soldiers coming. They know they have no choice. As Spider moves to the Rocker Boy's mangled form, Rogue grabs her arm, her hard eyes boring into Spider's own. Johnny's dead, Spider. Help me get Thompson out of here. Rogue's eyes speak of certainty and incredible pain, all slammed away behind an iron will to survive. Keep that meat baggage light, Race used to say. Spider reaches inside her jacket. She pulls out the data slug alt downloaded to her so long ago. It's surprisingly heavy. She whispers, Sorry, Johnny, as she rams it home into the back of the dying rocker's skull. Then she turns, reaches out for the data suitcase, but sees that it too has been savaged by gunfire. It's wrecked, two friends down in as many minutes. She quietly wishes Alt good luck. So it seems, contrary to what's depicted in Cyberpunk 2077, that Spider Murphy was actually the one to soul-kill Silverhand. However, she couldn't recover his body, so he was left behind while herself, along with Rogue and Lyle, fled for the roof. Their job was done. While Team Alpha was struggling against Adam Smasher, though, Team Beta was having problems of their own. Having already fought their way through many Arasaka soldiers, they encountered the solo Haruko Kanawa somewhere in sub-basement 14, the command center, the prime target from which Beta could ensure the destruction of the secure database. She was, of course, defeated, and the team was able to proceed to look around the facility, finding not only the reliquary database, but also the Soul Killer core. Though the Soul Killer lab may have been 120 floors above ground, its core was housed here, in the command center, and in that core was an engram that nobody could expect. For the name associated with this engram was Yorinobu Arasaka, soul killed almost a year prior on September 24th, 2022. But hold on, this can't be right, can it? Yorinobu plays a key role in Cyberpunk 2077 after all. Initially, I had assumed that this was a retcon, a byproduct of the 2030X timeline, but after looking into it a bit more, I've become slightly less sure. You see, in Cyberpunk 2077, there's a radio program put on by Maximum Mike, a character who is based off of and voiced by Mike Pondsmith. Mike's show can be heard occasionally on the Moro Rock radio station, and in it he'll talk about many in-universe mysteries, theories, and pieces of lore, often paired with a conspiracy theory of some kind. As luck would have it, one of these episodes is about Yorinobu, and, well, I'll play a portion of the broadcast now so you can hear for yourself. I even paired it up with some absolutely terrible first-person driving that I recorded for that authentic listening experience. Now, I'm sure you've seen the news, Yorinobu Arasaka's the new head of Arasaka Corporation. Yeah, I'm afraid that's not possible. The truth is, Yornobus is dead as a runner surf in the black wall, and he's been for the past 50 years. The official story is that after the death of his big brother, Yornobu came home, apologized to Big Daddy Saburo, and was accepted back into the family. That's a straight up con, people. Yornobu was in those towers when they got wiped off the map. Maybe even helped bring him down. And all the evidence is buried under a million tons of debris. We don't know. So who's this guy, you ask? The one on TV talking about his dear old dad and the virtues of the Arasaka family business? Yeah, I've got a few guesses. It's no secret Arasaka's been working on human cloning tech for almost a century now. So it's possible this guy is some sort of mind control clone of the original Yorinobu. Wouldn't that be just like old Saburo? Your kid doesn't turn out the way you want, so you just try again. It's worth noting that Sub-Basement 14 did also house cloning technology, as discovered by Team Beta. I think it's tough to say whether Mike's radio show constitutes a legitimate source for lore, or if it's more of a cheeky callback to the series past, but I definitely wanted to include it here, at least to give you the opportunity to decide what you believe for yourself. The option to rescue or leave Yorinobu Zengram is left open-ended, but the fate of the Reliquary database is not. If Team Beta tries to make a copy of the information, as was their secondary goal, it will be found to be unusable, in the same way net information would be. The other option, to plant the nuke and simply destroy the database, is also viable, but Firestorm Shockwave makes it very apparent
meant that the database is not supposed to survive intact in any version of the campaign. But as Team Beta primes the nuke for detonation, there's something about this bomb that I haven't yet told you, and something which the characters aren't aware of either. When the plan to plant the nuclear device beneath Arasaka HQ was first pitched to the incursion team, they were told that the explosion would not reach the surface. Nobody directly involved with the operation seemed to know the true extent of the devastation that a weapon like this could cause. Not even Morgan Blackhand was aware of this, as these details were kept a secret by General Eddington. In other words, those involved with setting the nuke thought that the city would be safe from damage. This was a lie. The bomb was definitely powerful enough to make a crater out of Corpo Plaza. As soon as Team Beta planted this device, a less than favorable future was secured. But let me remind you that there are multiple options here. In the very foundation of the Arasaka complex, there lay a bomb nearly four times as powerful as the one the incursion team had just dropped off. As we discussed earlier in the video, the future of Cyberpunk is radically altered if this weapon explodes. In the main Cyberpunk timeline, the one we're talking about today, it doesn't. But if it were to, we would enter the world of 2030X. At this point, both Team Alpha and Omega had made their way back to the tower roof, in order to be extracted by AV, and presumably Team Beta was making a break for it as well. But here, on the rooftop, the final moments of the night would unfold. Oh, Morgan. What the- Morgan snaps around and down, in a roll out of the AV's open hatch, the heavy assault rifle cradled in his arms. Ah, damn. Adam, what the hell is he wearing? One of the massive arms of the power frame Adam is wearing waves a jaunty hello, the biopod clutched in it shaking about like a child's toy. Oh, I'm sorry, you probably don't recognize him from this angle, but this is your friend Shayton, or what's left of him. I'm afraid Silverhand is in even worse shape. At least the Borg's still alive in here. I'd give him another good, uh, ten minutes for the pod's battery dies. But to get him, you're gonna have to get to me. Morgan turns to the AV. Get the hell out of here, now! Chief, we ain't leaving you here. You sure as hell are. You have to make sure Spider and the others get out. Now go. I'll be along in a minute. He watches the AV lift off, then turns back around. Cocking the rifle, he intones, All right, Pipsqueak, time to see if metal really is better than meat. Let's dance. Just as Adam Smasher and Morgan Blackhand were preparing to face off, however, the bomb detonated, with the tower collapsing beneath them. As the AV housing the surviving crew members, including Rogue, Spider, and Lyle, departed, the two combatants would disappear into the rubble, and from this point forward, the whereabouts of Morgan Blackhand are still completely unknown. Though Adam obviously survived. And it's also said that Shayton's biopod was still recoverable, and miraculously was virtually undamaged. In the days and weeks that followed the AHQ disaster, the response to such an earth-shaking event was staggering. President Elizabeth Kress, predictably, banned Arasaka from operation in the States, and also nationalized Militech, which may not have actually proved to be a punishment for them at all, but whatever. We'll leave that for another video. In the immediate aftermath, firefighters and emergency personnel would respond to the disaster site, one of these being the full Borg, Samantha Stevens, who was able to actually discover that undetonated nuke in the Tower Foundation, which she kind of just took? She had it sitting there for like 15 years, and Arasaka just kinda never did anything about it. I guess we know who recovered the weapon after all. The period between 2023 and 2045 would see Night City, and apparently other parts of the world, covered with red skies, tinted by the debris and fallout produced by the bombing, and by the carnage of the Fourth Corporate War. Before we leave off this tale for today, though, there are a few things from 2045 that I feel warrant to mention. In the cyberpunk red story Black Dog, a group of mercenaries are sent by Samantha Stevens to deliver a mysterious mysterious crate from Night City to Los Alamos, New Mexico. Spoilers, it has the nuke in it. Well, sort of. On their way to Los Alamos, the group transporting the object meet with many characters, including a Lobos Aldecaldo, who is actually part of Strike Team Alpha, which results in a pretty interesting retelling of events. It's not any different from what we've already outlined throughout the rest of this video, though, so I'm not going to read it aloud, but I highly recommend you check out the Cyberpunk Red Core book if this interests you even a little. The story is definitely worth a read. I am actually about to spoil the end of it, though, so if you're not into that and you want to read it for yourself, 
file first, then skip to the timestamp seen on screen, because this will definitely recontextualize the story for you. No, the revelation I'm interested in comes when the mercs actually reach Los Alamos. Here, they hand over the bomb to a woman named Angel, who rewards the group and then takes it away, apparently to be safely disarmed. However, while the main characters depart to make use of their reward money, we get a glimpse at what Angel is actually doing. Carefully, Angel rolls the heavy bomb casing over. She punches a code into the small keypad now exposed. There's a hissing of compressed air, of utter cold that blows back at her, as the casing splits to reveal the blue-white ice of the hidden cryo chamber. She looks tenderly down at the dark, frozen face behind its masking curtain of ice. Hello, my love, she says. It's never explicitly said, but many believe that the nuke was retrofitted to hold a cryo chamber by Samantha herself, a known fangirl of Johnny Silverhand. It stands to reason, then, that the crown jewel of her collection, recovered from the fallen Arasaka headquarters building all those years ago, may have been the body of Silverhand himself. If so, then this base in Los Alamos was probably where Adam Smasher would, at some point in the future, locate the Rocker Boy's body, as he was tasked with recovering Johnny's things around this time. Furthermore, one can only imagine that Spider Murphy's data slug may still have been attached, in which case it's hardly any wonder how Arasaka came to possess Silverhand's engram by the year 2077. It all really does come full circle, doesn't it? There can be no doubt that there is still a lot that could stand to be more concisely understood about the AHQ disaster. Lots of information, especially from the Firestorm books, would definitely benefit from being clarified. But to be honest, I think that the air of mystery surrounding this pivotal day in cyberpunk history is exactly what the creators at Artelsorian Games want. If anything, I think the Enigma only helps to further the legend, but there are still some unresolved plot threads that I can see being revisited. What happened to Shayton after his biopod was found undamaged in the rubble of the tower? Where was Morgan for the majority of the operation? And what was in that suitcase if not the nuke? It might also be nice to see some sort of resolution or further confirmation regarding Johnny's memories, as shown in Cyberpunk 2077 too. I for one would like to see something done with this at some point in the future. I feel that there's a real chance for that story to unfold soon too. After all, with the volume of new and upcoming cyberpunk media we've been seeing announced and released these days, it's really anyone's guess where the story goes from here. And I think that's where we're going to end things off for today, folks. So, as always, thank you for watching and joining me as we journeyed through the events of the AHQ disaster. I know this video was perhaps a tad less lore-focused and a bit more meta-analytical, what with having to deeply understand the cyberpunk canon and all that, but my goal with this one was to simply lay everything out and really get at the heart of this topic that I think many people still have sort of a hard time approaching. Regardless of all that, though, I hope that you enjoyed this special August 20th episode. I have been wanting to make and release this video ever since my very first cyberpunk lore upload. So it's finally here, and that's pretty exciting stuff for me at least. I really do truly want to hear what you guys have to say on this topic. There are still mysteries to be solved, and it's very possible that I've managed to miss something. Or maybe you have a take on where the story goes from here? Regardless, I firmly believe that the best way to come to any sort of conclusion on this stuff is to talk about it with others. So I swear this is not supposed to be a shallow ploy to grab your engagement, though obviously I won't pretend that that doesn't help the channel too. I actually am just interested in what you have to say. I make sure to read each and every comment that I get, and I try to respond to all of them that I can. What is a more direct appeal to your engagement, though, is asking you to like and subscribe to the channel if you're feeling generous enough to do so. By subscribing, you obviously get notified when I post more lore-related content down the road, whether it be from the world of cyberpunk or anywhere else. So yeah, I hope to see you around. Anyway, that's all for today. Happy August 20th, everyone. This is Averberon. I'll see you again soon, and have a good one.